It's Dr. Sabrina Siegel here to introduce a brand new special series brought to you by the NEI podcast. Welcome to the Psychopharmastology Show. In this special series, Dr. Andrew Cutler interviews Dr. Stephen Stahl on the most controversial, novel, and exciting topics in psychopharmacology today. Every three months, we will address a different theme in psychopharmacology. Each theme is split into three parts, with one part released each each month. The second theme we're addressing is on treatment resistant depression and suicide prevention. And this time we have some special experts on the topic joining us. Let's listen in to part three, Beyond the Storm, an update on suicide prevention and the suicide prevention handbook with Dr. Christine Moutier. Hello and welcome to another podcast in the Psychopharmacology series. I'm Dr. Andy Cutler, Chief Medical Officer of NEI, and today it's really my pleasure to have two of the authors of a new book coming out called The Suicide Prevention Handbook. The title of this podcast is Beyond the Storm, an Update on Suicide Prevention. And so with us today is Dr. Christine Moutier, who is Chief Medical Officer of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and her co-author, a gentleman you may have heard of, Dr. Stephen Stahl. So hello. How is everybody? Hi there. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. Great to have you here. Your other co-author is Dr. Anthony Pisani. I'm curious. We talk about suicidality as if it's one block thing. Christine, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between suicidal ideation and suicidality or suicidal behavior. How do we think about that? Sure. I'm glad you're actually bringing that up because the term suicidality really encompasses the full spectrum from suicidal thoughts to actions to death or family history of suicide. And so in the clinical world, we use that term a lot. And I, my, my main concern is that it's not the most precise term. So it's, I think people use it meaning someone with suicide risk, but we could be much more precise if we're talking about a recent suicide attempt or that you've just done a full suicide risk assessment and that's what you're basing your language on. I hate that term, Andy. I think it came from regulators at the FDA who were trying to prove that drugs caused you to kill yourself and they couldn't find it in actual suicide attempts or completions or whatever. And so suicidality is just basically coming to clinical use now and it's a very sloppy term. It can even mean insomnia caused by an antidepressant or yeah. a little activation. So I think That's it's, right. I've used it myself. I'm guilty of it, but I don't yes. like it. Yeah, I think it's, it's confusing. The warning label that antidepressants have talks about suicidal thoughts and behaviors, but it's not necessarily completed suicide. So people get confused by this, I think. Oh, absolutely. There's so much confusion about risk and benefits to patients on antidepressants when it comes to suicide risk and prevention. So the FDA decision back in the early 2000s was highly controversial at the time. We can certainly get into that topic because there are now studies that show that rates of diagnosing depression, rates of using treatment including antidepressants, but psychotherapies as well, all went down in the media swirl storm. So it has actually unintentionally done serious harm. And and Christina, what happened to suicides? Exactly. Suicides went up. And that is actually covered in in our book in more detail. I, I think it led to confusion among primary care physicians and among the public largely. But even as a psychiatrist and even as interested in suicide prevention as I was before I came to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, I did not fully grasp the reason for the controversy and how that decision was based only on being able to look at emergence of suicidal thoughts and not the full continuum of what happens with patients who are depressed and who may have suicide risk. There's a great study uh, by Greg Simon that shows the greatest prevalence and burden of suicide attempts happens the month before an antidepressant is started and diminishes thereafter. There's a whole body of literature, actually, that we probably should talk about so that clinicians can understand how to help patients best, really. Yeah, absolutely. Let's back up and talk a little bit about suicide rates. Are the suicide rates around the world all similar or all the same as they are in the U.S.? Oh, goodness. They are so vastly different. And even within the U.S., across the 50 states and within a given state, across the counties, vastly different. 
levels of rates. And so the global rate of suicide determined by the World Health Organization right now is 10.5 per 100,000 on an annual basis. And in the United States, the last year we have the rate calculated for was 2019, and it was 13.9 per 100,000. So we're not, for as resourced a nation as we are, we are not doing that well with suicide prevention. And in fact, it's been going in the wrong direction over a 20-year period, whereas many rates in other countries have actually been coming down. And we believe the global suicide rate has actually been decreasing over recent years. And how, how do we account for that? Well, there are a number of evidence-based strategies that do definitely reduce suicide risk of a population. Some countries have been quite serious about full-scale implementation of their national suicide prevention plans. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., we've had, I would say, lip service to it in that the starting with Surgeon General David Satcher back in, you know, around 2000, really over 20 years ago, we had our first national suicide prevention plan that was recently updated within the last few months, but we have barely scratched the surface in terms of full-scale implementation. So clearly we could be doing better, it sounds like. Again, we, we started out talking about suicidal ideation versus attempts. What is the rate of suicidal ideation? Do we have any idea of what, what that is? We do. There's lots of different data points. For teens and young adults, the prevalence of suicidal thoughts is higher during that phase of our lives than it is as we age through our, our life cycle. But the most recent sort of population scale data point we have is from the Kessler catchment area study. And it showed that 13.5% of Americans have had suicidal thoughts in their lifetime. 4.6% have had attempts. That doesn't square completely when you look at the fact that every year high schoolers are surveyed in the Youth Behavior Risk Survey, and mm -hmm. between 15 and 20% of them mm -hmm. say they've mm -hmm. had suicidal thoughts within the last 30 days. So I think people actually forget at a later stage in their life when they might have been caught <laughs> in, you know, in a survey yeah. later. So the rate of suicidal thoughts is actually, we estimate that it's between probably 30 and 40% of the total population. Mm -hmm. And those can be very fleeting thoughts. Those do mm -hmm. not necessarily indicate a full-blown suicide risk by any means. But once you advance to behavior, really even through the planning stage and into suicide attempt, I think that's where we look at, okay, now there are some serious suicide risk factors that have just led that person to move from ideation into action. And that is a much more serious situation. Well, you've mentioned risk factors. I'm dying to know what are the risk factors? Obviously, depression would be one, but yes. what are the... Oh, there there are a number of well-known risk factors that really the way we think about it is like heart disease, that it's always going to be multiple risk factors converging or kind of piling up on top of each other to create that moment of risk, which is very, very dynamic, as you know, in a person's life. This is not a concrete thing. It's not set in stone. So genetics matter, family history matters, early upbringing Traumatic events, the ACEs study clearly shows that having several early childhood adverse events is not good for many outcomes, including suicide right. risk. But largely, one of the most potent risk factors, obviously, are mental health conditions. And I would consider them almost necessary but insufficient risk factors mm -hmm. because, of course, thankfully, the majority of our patients do not die by suicide. So even among mm -hmm. people with depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, addictions, it is still not the majority. So there are other life circumstance, family influences, and culture, the environmental culture, and, mm -hmm. and whether you have a belief that you can seek help for yourself, that doesn't make you a less valuable person. Now, that's hard because when you're depressed, your brain is playing tricks on you. And all of these risk factors are really viewed as lifetime risk factors. And so in your suicide risk assessment, which we'll get into later, I'm sure, it's very important to look at what are the sort of drivers pressing upon those more long-standing risk factors. And of course, to go after those very aggressively, just like a mm -hmm. cardiologist or primary care does for heart mm -hmm. disease. They don't question it. They go aggressively after those risk factors. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there are risk factors, but you know, it seems like we're not great at predicting who's going to commit suicide and certainly not predicting when that might happen. 
That is correct. And, and I'm glad you brought up prediction because I think we, maybe because we're in the behavioral health arena, have gotten, in my humble opinion, sort of hung up on the idea of lack of predictability. And I'll take it back to the heart disease model. There are many people, obviously, who, who tragically and unfortunately die from heart disease. And the science is not able to predict which person at which exact time that that will happen. But it does not take away from prevention still being very potent and, and possible. And so it's that same model that, that we think about suicide prevention. And we don't want to make clinicians or family members feel as if prevention, the term preventable, means that every instance can be prevented. That is not what we mean by the term prevention, it, nor is it for right. other leading causes of death. But it does mean that if we invest in the research, the clinical interventions, and the public health model by educating the public and changing culture so that it becomes common knowledge about how to protect your mental health and suicide risk, just like we have that sort of common knowledge about other physical health factors in our lives. That uh, approach, there is no reason to think that if we invest in that and again, scale it up so that we are actually living it as a society, that we won't be able to drive down the rate of suicide. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the public health model of suicide prevention. Could you speak a little more about that? Sure. The public health model for any disease or leading cause of death prevention really looks like the, the sort of layered approach where there's something that we do for all people universally, and then there are actions that we take for a select group and then an indicated group for more significant treatment. And that same model is actually the way we at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and I think increasingly clinicians also understand that, yes, their role can actually be at multiple levels in this public health model of preventing suicide. So there is actually a, a wonderful review that just came out uh, a month or two ago published by John Mann in the American Journal that reviewed all of the public health strategies, including clinical treatment uh, for suicide prevention, and found a number of them now have the evidence. And, and I want to stress mm -hmm. that we didn't have this data. Even John Mann actually did that same review about 15 years ago and came up with a very sort of weak list that had evidence. And now that list has grown much longer. So the science is actually showing us answers in a brand new way that I just can't emphasize enough that as clinicians, if you trained more than five or 10 years ago, you probably didn't get an education that was aligned with that science because mm -hmm. that's actually how mm -hmm. rapidly and, and recent it's been growing and changing. So tell me a little more about what are some of the evidence-based interventions for suicide? Sure. One of the most powerful ones that we've actually known about for some time is the aggressive identification uh, of suicide risk, the aggressive identification of depression and other mm -hmm. mental health conditions. It's not just only about depression, but depression, of mm -hmm. course, is the most common and probably one of the more potent among psychiatric conditions. So for example, when you train primary care doctors how to do that, it, it identify suicide risk, identify depression, and give them some tools to manage it in, in a chronic illness management sort of manner, just like they know how to do for hypertension or diabetes, you actually can show that they drive down that population's risk of suicide. That has been demonstrated now in several countries, including mm. in the U.S. It's very powerful stuff. It's actually how the zero suicide movement got going here in the United States. One of the questions I have is how are we going to get clinicians, but who are the majority listening to this, to pivot from treating individuals to treating populations? Because I treat one patient at a time, you hear. And right. so I don't treat in a public health model. I individualize treatments down to the single person. So I need to prevent or predict, God forbid, suicide in this patient now and not the fact that I'm treating patients in a population in my practice or, or over a career that if I apply these principles generally will have good effects, but not necessarily to the specific patient at the specific time. It's a whole different way of practicing medicine. It's true. 
It's true. And I don't want to be discouraging of clinicians because we all do have an incredibly important role to play because guess where people are sent when their suicide risk is detected, whether it's in their school or their workplace or their family, they come to us. And actually they come Mm -hmm. to primary care even more than they come to us. They also come to emergency departments. If we learn how to do a systematic suicide risk assessment and not let our anxiety get the best of us, but dive right in, be compassionate, caring, lead them through a safety planning exercise that you come back and you revisit over time. You pay attention to lethal means in their home environment. You get the family involved when you can, when it's possible. That is life-saving for those patients. That has been demonstrated at the clinical intervention level. And and by the way, there are also treatments that were newly designed with suicide risk reduction in mind. So we can talk about those later as well, because those are more specialty referrals. But Steve, I think what you're talking about is a system-wide approach that if you're a clinician that also happens to be a health system leader in any shape or form, you do have a role to play in this public health model because what you can do is set up your health system in, in the way that I mentioned. Zero Suicide Framework is one example, but doesn't have to be that particular flavor or brand, but there are ways for the system to understand that suicide is a preventable clinical target to go after, just like they have other clinical targets in the system. You set it up in the exact same way. It becomes part of the electronic health record. There's a dashboard. You do training and education, just wrong side surgery or hand washing. All of those initiatives through that safety and quality framework, suicide prevention can be approached the same way in health systems. Well, I tell these same clinicians when they say, well, you know, I I treat one at a time and not in a system. I say, don't you do psychosis risk prevention? And don't you know that despite treating psychosis, it sometimes happens in different patients at different times? You're not preventing all psychosis. But if you do that over your practice, you're going to prevent psychosis. Any risk assessment. Even in the state hospital system, we've taken a kind of public health approach to violence risk assessment. Yes, exactly. You can't tell which patient's going to do it when, but if you do certain interventions in a system-wide if, and you participate in that, over time, you are going to prevent whatever, violent psychosis, panic attacks. Yes, absolutely. Right. So I, I think the message for clinicians is learn the, this set of skills, or, or I, I wouldn't say learn, augment, because we all learned it to some extent. But we know we practiced at a time when there wasn't a lot of science guiding. And so you were somehow supposed to be magically predicting. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling when you have your patient there in front of you. And you know in your heart of hearts that you can't, but you're weighing their level of risk in this moment relatively relative to their baseline level of risk and also relative to other, your maybe your whole patient population, and you're taking steps that simply move towards that risk. I think for a long time, we didn't ask because if we uncovered it, we didn't know what to do. And now there is a set of kind of what we consider minimum standard practice steps to take that have to do with Again, safety planning, lethal means counseling, increasing the frequency of contact, which even if you can't do that through in-person visits, it can mean that there's some communication that can happen on a more frequent basis. That's actually one of the most powerful actions that health systems are doing. It's carrying contacts where they set up even text messages, emails that express a a caring message to patients who these studies were done actually for patients who were being discharged from either the psych unit or an emergency department after a suicide-related reason for being there and showed that those who got the carrying contacts versus treatment as usual alone, their subsequent suicide attempt rate was decreased by around 50% on average. There's about 12 different studies that have shown this. It's quite Um, remarkable. Well, I tell you what, I mean, anybody listening in to here who's ever had a person go to a vet or to a really good dentist will know that you will get follow-up calls after you take your pet in or after you take your teeth (laughs) in. Right, right. It's like, why the heck are we not doing this in mental health where the stakes might be arguably higher? So it's common sense that this works. It is. I think it just, it was almost like too common sense so that you really think, wow, we are such social creatures. We're really wired to just respond to those rather generic caring messages. But yes, we actually are. And look, our history as a field set us up to feel like 
we have to constantly be setting boundaries and limits and teaching patients, you know, not rewarding. There was a lot that was just not understood about suicide risk. So that now that we know that, obviously, we still need to be very cognizant of professional boundaries and setting our patients up for their best outcomes by learning how they tick. But this literature about caring contacts really does have implications for both clinicians, but also for systems, because the burden shouldn't all fall to the clinician. That would not be possible. Mm -hmm. We have to have the support and the time. Primary care has to be able to make a referral and actually have that referral happen in a timely manner. Those are the kind of issues that are more system fractures that need uh, addressing. You mentioned a couple of times now things that we didn't used to know, but there are also a lot of myths that surround suicide. Can you tell us what some of the major myths are, where they come from, and what we can do about them? There are a number of myths that are still very prevalent out there in the general public. Ideas around suicide that have to do with a person's character, their mm -hmm. nature, rather than understanding that suicidal thoughts and risk come from the human condition. Mm -hmm. Suicidal thoughts really are our minds attempt to problem solve and cope. And then again, moving on into action is really driven by a set of health risk factors. We have to dispel that myth that's about cowardice or weakness because it really is just a bunch of baloney. It, it would be like thinking that about cancer victims. Another one though, is that people who are at high risk of suicide are bent on suicide in a way that is immutable. And we know from the science that suicide risk is highly dynamic. And mm -hmm. so what that means is that if you sense that your loved one or your patient is at high risk, you cannot underestimate how much of a potential you can have. Again, the confusing part is that because the brain is involved, this is complicated. Decisions are being made in that state of suicidal crisis, but not in a way that that person in their healthy brain state would make. So it's all to say that you should move closer. You absolutely should express caring and compassion. I think some of the old myths actually led us to feel that people were just being manipulative. There was even one that I heard from a pediatrician that who said to parents of a, a, a teenager who uh, was was suicidal, that there's no need to worry about it because it's not the ones that, who are talking about their suicidal thoughts you need to worry about. So the truth is that when people become suicidal and become at risk, the majority of them give hints, if not overtly tell someone. For young people, it's actually more often a peer than it is an adult. And that's kind of a scary thing. It's the reason we have a campaign called Seize the Awkward that helps teens to know what to do if they sense that their friend is struggling. But as a parent or as a primary care or a mental health professional, moving into that and really asking the patient about it, just like you would probe any other presenting symptom. You want to know when did it start? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Mm -hmm. Understanding their particular drivers is absolutely indicated. So that bent on suicide idea is very wrong and, and really I think made us feel very helpless in the face of suicide risk, which look, it is scary and it is anxiety provoking. But if we learn more, we can put aside our anxiety and be there for our patients. And by taking those steps, by the way, we actually protect our own medical liability as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think you bring up something very important. Modern medicine, I think a lot of us are trained in a way that we need to do something. We need to act. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just sitting there and talking with the person, asking these questions, showing your concern is very therapeutic. Yes, yes. So. Yes, when you really start to understand the patient perspective, you know, there's this whole lived experience movement in the suicide prevention world. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many reasons that individuals don't tell their clinician when they're having suicidal thoughts, which is ironic, right? They're there to get help. But there are lots of fears about being judged more than anything, even more so than of involuntary hospitalization. As clinicians, we need to understand that so that we create a safe space where they know that 
if they're having suicidal thoughts, we actually want to understand them more and help the patient to understand how they tick. That the importance of the safety plan is that it actually equips the patient with their own set of steps based on their own triggers and warning signs and what helps them. So it's very patient centric. So it sounds like demonstrating curiosity is very important. I think we all do better with a clinician who is curious and seems to genuinely want to know about us. Yes. And I think maybe teaching or modeling for a patient to be curious about their own inner workings and their own thoughts might be helpful here. I I think that's right. There's one more point of confusion, maybe a myth. There is that myth that, that says that if you ask a person if they're having suicidal thoughts, you might make somebody worse or suicidal. And that has been proven untrue. And I've thought about it a lot. I think it might come from a place of the fact that there is such a thing as suicide contagion, which is a very different construct and and set of contexts. It's when a suicide has happened, let's say, by a celebrity or by a peer. Youth are more prone to suicide contagion, first of Mm -hmm. all. So I, I think there developed some confusion about the caring and compassionate asking about whether somebody's having thoughts of suicide with the true phenomena of contagion, which can happen when suicide is presented in a kind of glorified way, when graphic method of suicidal behavior is shown in entertainment or in mm-hmm. newspaper, journalism, social media, of course, now is something to worry about related to contagion. So anyway, I it's something that we need to understand. If somebody's feeling suicidal and you don't ask and they never get to express it, that is far more dangerous for them than being able to disclose it, receive support for it, and be led to the help that they need. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, we've talked a little bit about various interventions. Is there a role for medications here to help or hinder suicide prevention? There absolutely is a role. And the guidance that I provide to prescribers is to do what you normally do, which is we think about their psychiatric illness, their condition. So if it's depression or if it's bipolar disorder, absolutely be as aggressively managing that as possible. We know that aiming for remission and aiming for full symptom control has in incredibly important ramifications for the short and long term. It also does for suicide risk. So that's number one. But then number two, and I think this is where the new information comes to bear, it's to consider suicide risk its own clinical target. And when you understand the data with surrounding some of the medications, such as lithium, clozapine, ketamine, and the class of antidepressants as a whole, you can understand that there are ways to judiciously use those medications to mitigate a a patient's suicide risk. That is a whole complex topic, but I would just say that we were sent a message by that black box warning that has led to extremely negative ramifications for suicide. Yeah, I think you're right. The one other thing I would chime in here about medicines is that not everybody who's depressed should get an antidepressant. What? <laughs> you talking about bipolar depression? Not only bipolar, but these mixed features. And so mm. the studies, Goldberg and others have shown that the people with at least a, a mood disorder that is bipolar tend to actually commit suicide, not during the manic or the depressed phase, but in a mixed state. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that could be, it hasn't been as well studied in unipolar depression with mixed features. But what has been studied is that antidepressants that are reuptake blockers don't work for those people and actually either don't work or make you worse and can possibly activate mania and, and maybe even activate suicide. I don't know. We haven't studied it that way. What the point would be, if you're depressed, think outside the box. Make sure that they're not in a mixed state because that mixed state is a dangerous one and can be treated, but much differently than garden variety depression, which in the mixed state is treated much more successfully with certain atypical antipsychotics than it is with reuptake blocking antidepressants. Right. Yeah, Steve, I've always thought that that's where that black box warning comes from, because one of the risk factors for bipolarity is early onset depression before the age of 25. So some of these people were getting traditional reuptake inhibiting antidepressants and probably had a bipolar illness. And I think you're absolutely right. If you go back and ask the sites whether they screened aggressively for mixed features in their children and adolescents, 
you will find that they didn't. And this was before this kind of idea came out. And furthermore, when mixed features are studied, it might be 25 to 30 percent of adults with a major depressive episode that have never been manic or hypomanic, excuse me, have mixed features of their major depressive episode, but it could be half of children. So you have early onset, you have mixed features, don't give them an antidepressant many times. You give them a typical antipsychotic because it could be that you do activate people in a way where they're very uncomfortable with akathisia or whatever. It hasn't been studied. It's a hypothesis. It hasn't been proven, but watch out for mixed states. I think this is really clinically relevant and helpful. And, you know, we're talking about different populations, especially different ages. So, Christine, how, how do cultural and societal factors impact suicide prevalence, especially in specific populations like adolescents? I would say that cultures, whether it's within our American culture, and of course, there are many cultures within our nation, or we're thinking about cross-national cultures, there are some common themes that have been shown to increase likelihood of suicide or decrease. And those have to do with beliefs around self-sufficiency, stoicism, also social connectedness, which is a very powerful protective factor against suicide. That can be part of a culture for being connected, not just being a lone individual. Uh, again, that concept of self-sufficiency, that is a very bad thing for suicide risk. And it is very hypertrophied in American culture. If you, if you look at our pillars, our country was built upon. All of those things, if you think about the occupations that have the, the highest suicide risk, which include the agricultural industry, the construction industry, fishing and gaming, the physicians and other healthcare workers, law enforcement, military. Those are all cultures within those occupational confines that are highly stoic and actually view ourselves as somehow our identity wrapped around being a helper or healer and almost above being human in a way. And the truth is we are all human. So we all could have suicide risk and mental health vulnerabilities that we inherited by no choice or no actions of our own. So those messages that needing help at different times is just part of being human. And it's actually a strength to do that. That's something that I told every class of medical students coming in to the School of Medicine where I was a dean for students that there will come a time when you do that because that's just simply part of being human. So let's be smart about it and proactively manage our mental health. And of course, that's a huge thing related to burnout and, and yeah. mental health and, and suicide risk among physicians and other healthcare workers. Yeah, it is ironic, as you mentioned, that the risk is higher amongst those of us who are trying to help other people and help them with their suicidality. Yes, yes. When it comes to youth, I think some of the concerning things going on are that we have this sort of, in a way, I think, paradoxical situation right now where the idea of mental health has been beautifully normalized through many reasons, I think science itself and, and the neuroscience is trickling into mainstream culture to understand that our brain can get sick and our brain is part of our body. Mental health is an aspect of health. But I think what we haven't done is to help entertainment content creators and social media influencers to deepen teens and, and young people's understanding so that it can be actionable in a positive way instead mm -hmm. of feeling distressed expressing that, but having that just spiral around without a constructive kind of support network. The way I look at it is we haven't deepened mental health literacy nor suicide prevention literacy enough to meet that demand that now, if you look at the rates of anxiety symptoms and even suicidal ideation among young people, it has been on the rise b yes. long before the pandemic. And yes. so we really have to be paying attention. It's why suicide prevention efforts and education in schools and with parent communities and with entertainment content creators is really very important. It's something that I have the kind of privilege of being involved with all of those sort of non-clinical settings. There's a tremendous openness, but it is very new. So in talking about various populations, what do we need to know about suicide prevention for older individuals? Yes. So I think some of the myths surrounding older individuals and suicide and, and depression as well is that 
even clinicians can buy into the sort of erroneous belief that at the end of life, there are so many losses going on, the loss of autonomy Mm -hmm. and major health issues and disability, that of course you would be depressed or suicide might be viewed as a more quote unquote rational outcome. And the Mm -hmm. truth is, Depression is an illness at any stage of life, including among older adults. And Mm -hmm. so when I think about the main risk factors for suicide among older individuals, I think about something that my my good colleague, Yates Conwell, who is a, a geriatric psychiatrist and suicide prevention expert, he calls it the four Ds. It, so if, if we think about depression, physical disease and disability coming from those diseases, disconnection and access to deadly means. If we can attend to those as their clinician or as their family member, we will be reducing their suicide risk. That is extremely helpful. That is really helpful. Now, what about suicide prevention in military and veteran populations? We all have heard about the high rates of suicide in those folks. Yes. And in the U.S., in fact, military and veteran suicide rates were not always higher than the general population. But over the last decade or so, now they have increased to be one and a half times that of the general population. And what the research out of many military suicide studies, as well as in the VA and among veterans, is are actually some surprising things in a way. I think people had assumed that combat exposure was going to be one of the key risk factors driving suicide. And that turned out not to be the case, actually. But that periods of transition in yeah. the course yeah. of a military individual's life, including mm-hmm. the transition out of active duty into mm-hmm. uh, you know civilian life and being a veteran, including untreated and unrecognized mental health conditions, Mm -hmm. even before they joined the military or when the onset was in the military, certainly PTSD, traumatic Mm -hmm. brain injury, and then among female, but also male military personnel, military sexual trauma has to be mentioned as a key thing, especially among female veterans Mm -hmm. and, and military personnel. What we see in this suicide burden and changing in the rates are that now the suicide rates have been going up more recently among, again, female veterans, as well as the younger veteran age population. So if you've been assuming that it's Vietnam veteran population or older and males, of course, males always have higher rates than females in almost every population studied. But among veterans and military personnel, that gap narrows because of those higher risks for female veterans. You're reminding me, I've worked with a lot of professional athletes and they struggle the most during the period of transition from when they retire. And you're going from a highly structured environment where you know what you're supposed to do every day. You have a lot of camaraderie and this kind of thing. And then you go into this uh, zone where you don't know what you're supposed to do and you don't have a routine. Yes. Again, it's so basic that you it almost feels you know bad to think about human beings and ourselves in this reductionistic way. But we need social connection. We need a purpose and we need structure in our life. And so those transitions are very destabilizing. And if an individual has pre-existing mental health condition or other suicide risk factors, a family history of suicide, it is a time to be on the lookout for. And it's just a different way to think about our patients as we're following them over time. And as we see those life transitions coming, it, it actually is a time where you can help them protect their resilience and their suicide risk. Well, I think you're right. And also the, helping the person with their identity, you're not just this or that. But you just brought up some great points that we can use to help someone find uh, camaraderie, help them find meaning and value and purpose. Those sound to me like good ways to help prevent suicide as well. Yes, absolutely. It's partly why I think peer support and Mm -hmm. the lived experience movement, and as well as suicide loss survivors, find tremendous positive impact by being part of their own community. And Mm -hmm. so it is about how do you manage your own needs and also access treatment. I think the ultimate combination that is protective for people who have suicide risk is that combination of self-insight and peer support, family support, along with an expert clinician who's following them over time. You mentioned suicide loss survivors. Are they at higher risk of suicide as well? 
Yes, unfortunately, they are. And it's not just after a person experiences the loss of a loved one to suicide, as you may know, it's a very traumatizing experience of loss. And so loss on its own is a suicide risk factor, let alone if your loved one died by suicide. And so that traumatic loss, but I think additionally, remember, if that is a blood relative, there might be some shared genes there in terms of shared elevations. So it's not purely necessarily just experiential or environmental. There can be other mechanisms that increase that individual's risk for suicide. There are also physical health ramifications of complicated grief. And I'm so happy to say that in the new DSM, we are seeing the prolonged grief disorder, which was formerly called complicated grief, as its own diagnostic entity, because it really is very important to understand that Grief is normal. It's a healthy part, ubiquitous part of of being human. But when it is complicated and Mm -hmm. and stalled and when that yearning is so overwhelming that the person cannot participate in their life or in their current relationships, Mm -hmm. that can be absolutely debilitating and increase the risk. And the good news is that there are things they can do to mitigate that risk. Absolutely. You mentioned uh, support groups and, and various ways to connect people. Yes. Processing grief is always important. And again, a lot of people do that in their own way, on their own time. So it's not that everyone needs, you know, mental health treatment. But in the case of suicide loss, I think that I would encourage anyone to at least try some therapy, try a support group, find what works for you and don't be closed off to it over time because sometimes people figure that out even years later. And it can be quite remarkable to see those longer term suicide loss survivors finding what works for them at a time when they're ready to do that. It's just that it it could be that there are years then of suffering and disability that can occur. So we do encourage coming into the suicide loss support community, which is very robust. There's nothing like being understood by somebody who's been through a shared type of experience and being able to speak heart to heart and to listen and to understand that suicide loss survivors want to remember their loved one. They want their loved one's name to be said. But stigma and shame has gotten in the way of that in our society even. that That is changing, as I mentioned, in this world of lived experience and suicide loss survivors. So that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Now, we've talked about various different populations. There's another population I want to ask your thoughts about. What what is unique about the risk of suicide for the LGBTQ population? Oh, goodness. I want to be clear that it is not the fact of their sexual orientation or gender identity that confers any mental health, including suicide risk. It is the way that they are encountered and treated in the world. And that means in their families, in their schools, in their workplaces. And of course, the world has changed dramatically because of the advocacy around LGBT rights, which has been amazing to see that. And yet, it doesn't mean that somebody who is trying to figure out out their own sexual orientation or identity as a teenager in a family that may not be educated or accepting about these issues. So it is the issues of discrimination, trauma, um, assault. As you may know, many teens and young adults end up homeless because yes. of family values. There's this beautiful thing happening in some faith communities that is learning how, without having to change your religious values, to still express love and support for your child, your loved one. And those actions and those words are what matter the most. You can hang on to all of your faith beliefs but and still love your child. And so there are ways to learn how to do that. That's a whole niched movement that's very important. But I will just say it. If you have people in your life who are LGBTQ or figuring it out, you being a a supporter of them by saying that I love you for who you are. You get to be you is very important, whatever your relationship is with them. Now, if you're doing therapy with somebody who's trying to figure out whether to come out or whether to to transition, if, if they may be trans, those are those are more complicated questions. Of course, you should be supportive, but also help them understand what their life will look like on the other side of that, because there can actually be increased risks with that transitioning if they have not thought it through and prepared their important people in their life for what is about to happen. 
Yeah, it's very interesting that uh, we're talking about this. The former Bachelor star Colton Underwood, who just came out as being gay. I'm not sure if you saw this, but this was a very recent. Obviously, his life has changed greatly, too. I, I want to. I want to switch gears. We've talked a little bit about adolescence and younger folks. There's a recent study, it was in uh, Psychiatric Services by Lipson et al., reported that over 50% of community college students met the criteria for one or more mental health problems, including 15% that had suicidal ideation. I believe further analysis revealed that less than 30% of them accessed mental health treatment in the past year. What are your thoughts on this? That is absolutely consistent with other college and high school age data that that we've been seeing for years. And again, we talked earlier about how is it that mental health experiences are becoming this commonplace? In that particular study, it was a community college student sample, but you, it, it, the same or, or nearly uh, similar estimates are going to be found in other young adult and teenage populations. And again, I think sometimes it's an issue of the methodology that we might be talking about symptoms versus a full diagnosable syndrome. So there, we have to be careful about that because certain conditions are probably not on the rise, but the experience of anxiety, depression, loneliness, and, and suicidal thoughts can absolutely be on the rise. I think about social media and how prevalent that has become and for many, it is a way to connect at times in their life and at other times in their life, it makes them feel more isolated and sort yes. of outside of everyone who looks like they're having a great time presenting their perfect self online. Young people don't have a way to gauge that. And even as an adult, you have to constantly reality check that comparison yes. game. It is nothing but toxic for our brains and our mental health to go down that rabbit hole. And so I think about the young people who already start out with some vulnerabilities of, let's say, trauma, depression, anxiety, PTSD, or addiction. And when they engage, their perceptions around social media are informed and influenced by those mental health roots. And it also it can change the way they're interacting. For many young people, IRL, it's not one or the other. It's all in real life for them. And so these interactions they're having are absolutely impactful and real for them. And I think the bottom line is that there are too many barriers in the way of accessing support right now and for connecting with one another and for receiving the mental health care that can make a huge difference. That 30% connecting to treatment and similar rates, sometimes even lower for suicidal students, for suicidal medical students, that that just should not be the case. I, I think about the way that we are resourced as a nation with science, systems design, technology, we have to become more sophisticated about suffering and, and just root out that stigma and understand that when you're the one who is suffering, it's hard to reach out. It cannot be incumbent upon people who are suffering. We have to create that environment around, around ourselves. This could be us at some point in our lives. And we want to make sure to build a culture that understands that and, and creates pathways so that those barriers can be reduced. I was just going to say, to your point of this happening in adolescence and children, I was just giving a lecture today where I had to review some of the data and was reminded that half of all diagnoses in psychiatry are presented by age 14 yes. and three quarters by age 24. That's so right. in addition to all the social pressures and everything else that's going on, this is when they're catching their psychiatric disorders. And so that's a clash. That exactly. Problems. And think about the way that young people are viewed by teachers, by many parents, that without this mental health condition, psychiatric condition lens, they just think it's because of this stress in their life. And even the idea that we're going to do harm by having them see a psychiatrist, there's a lot of work we have to do. Yeah. And we mentioned earlier the role of transitions. This is a period of major transition that you're going through too and discovering who you are and you're forming your identity. We've talked a little bit about technology and, and it's interesting to me now that there are some technological sources of therapy now. There's online therapy. You can do computer therapy, even programs where it's not a real person in a way that right. you're getting therapy. And I think one of the things COVID-19 has taught us, of course, is how to use technology therapeutically. The mm -hmm. obvious, of course, is using Zoom and telepsychiatry and this kind of thing. What are your thoughts about the use of technology here to help? It's 
super important, but has to be explored and, and studied further. It is remarkable that during the pandemic, our surveys and the CDC surveys show that one in four American adults say they are accessing mental health care, mostly through tele-virtual means. That may be an all-time high, and yet access to mental health treatment, the gap is still widening, probably because it's being overwhelmed by the number of people seeking services. So, it's a huge issue. And at AFSP, we're actually the leading private funder of all suicide and suicide prevention related research. And one of our priorities currently for our research grants program is the use of technology. The other priority, by the way, relates to diversity and people from uh, marginalized, and minoritized communities. Mm -hmm. That is, there's a dearth of research related yeah. to even risk factors, let alone prevention strategies. So, Technology is being used in some wonderful ways for preventing suicide. There are both clinical interventions that can be delivered effectively using technology, safety planning, something as important and basic to suicide prevention as safety planning, has numerous apps now, including the Barbara Stanley and Greg Brown original app, but those are being utilized by many, many people. There are apps being studied. We're funding a, a study with David Brent's app that helps bridge inpatient and outpatient treatment for adolescents at risk of suicide. And Cheryl King is also using technology for her very important work where teenagers at risk for suicide identify their trusted adults and bring them into their communication circle and their treatment plan while they're inpatient bridging to outpatient. Those are finding very positive results for reducing suicide risk among young people. But there's much more that can be done. Many of the leading social media platforms platforms are looking into ways to use their platform to ultimately prevent suicide. There's also the use of ecological momentary assessment where there's passive uh, level of monitoring so that we can actually detect sleep, movement, use of, use of social media and things like that to detect changes in patterns in, in a person's life that could, in fact, indicate that suicide risk is emerging. That brings up, of course, a whole other level of ethics and oversight and needs more sure. data. But we sure. may come to a point in the next decade or two where there's a combination of the data from the electronic health record and clinical interventions being delivered alongside these more community-based use of technology to prevent suicide. It sounds like a very exciting time. There's a lot we have learned, but with a lot more we need to learn. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, and I feel like we could continue this discussion <laughs> for a lot longer. There's so much more to talk about here. But I really want to thank you, Christine, very much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and for covering the topic of suicide prevention. Steve and I are very excited about our book that we'll be releasing in late May. So, Fairly soon. I was going to ask that. So please, for those listening, please pick up the book. It's called The Suicide Prevention Handbook. And Steve, I want to thank you too for your contribution here. Mostly I was a fly on the wall listening to, in great fascination, but to get the book in Cambridge University Press in a few weeks. Yeah, thanks so much. So thank you, the audience, for listening to another episode in our series of this podcasts called The Psychopharmacology Show. NEI and, membership. Uh, please, uh, check the 2021 out the NEI already, Synapse Virtual Half-Day Series so much, is everyone. included with NEI membership. Become a member today so that you can register for free for any or all of the monthly half days in which Dr. Stahl and colleagues will spend the last Saturday morning of each month sharing cutting-edge research and clinical insights on the topics most relevant to real world practice. Don't miss out. Become a member today. Visit www.neiglobal.com to learn more.